This morning, if you are keeping up with the little bit of a change in plans that we had last week, we're going to be going back in our book a few pages to page 118, to page 118. And if you do not have a copy of that outline, if you will raise your hand at this time, some of our men will bring you some copies and get that to you. But we are in 118. Last week we had a special lesson that was a little bit out of sync with our study through the Bible this year. And so this morning we're going to take a look at Acts, the first 12 chapters, and then this evening we are going to look at chapters 13 through the end of the book. And so I want to encourage you to be back tonight at 6 o'clock so that you can be a part of that study as we complete and get a good overall look today at the book entitled The Acts of the Apostles. This morning what I want us to take a look at beginning in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 is that classic definition of faith that we find in Scripture. Uh, it reads, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Most of us learn this passage of Scripture from the King James Version where it talks about it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But I want you to notice the not seen part because it is indeed the case that we have never seen God face to face. We have never seen heaven. We have never seen with our own eyes or heard with our ears or witnessed the miracles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This was something that was a privilege for a few in the first century, but does that put us at a disadvantage? No. But what we're going to take a look at, especially as we study this morning the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, we're going to talk about the unique situation that the apostles found themselves in in the first century. We're going to talk this morning about seeing is believing. And we're going to examine the things that they were able to see and how that impacted and even increased their faith. If you will, take a look at page 118 and follow along with me with the, as we read the introduction on the left-hand side of the page. Seeing is believing. How many of us believe in UFOs, unidentified flying objects? How many of us believe in sea monsters? And you notice the author writes in uh, parentheses, for those of you who just raised your hands, we do have padded wagons waiting at each exit. Do you realize that there have been over 70,000 reported sightings of USO, UFOs since World War II? I personally do not believe in UFOs, but there are 70,000 individuals out there who do. I don't happen to believe in sea monsters, but there are many who have visited Loch Ness or seen something on the high seas who believe fervently in such things. What makes the difference between me and them? They saw something I haven't seen. For those people, UFOs or sea monsters aren't really a matter of hard evidence or scientific probabilities or logical assumptions. Rather, they have witnessed something that will make believers of them no matter what science or evidence or logic may say. You can argue with them till you are blue in the face. Ultimately, they will only smile and say, I know what I saw. Seeing is believing. And that fact is central to an understanding of the book of Acts. You cannot approach this book and understand its heart and dynamic without understanding the importance of seeing to the book. The faith, the zeal, and the evangelistic fervor of the disciples in Acts is founded on the fact that they could smile and say, we know what we saw. These were eyewitnesses of Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection. That witness charged the early church with a sense of conviction and urgency which had rare, has rarely been seen at any time since. I want you to think about that because that is a unique situation that they are in. 
that was a unique time. And certainly they had that blessing. What can we learn from that this morning? Well, let's take a look first of all at the emphasis on the book, on the word witness in the book of Acts. I want us to take a look at this word witness. We're talking about eyewitness accounts. You know, some people today throw around the word witness and especially in the religious world in a very loose way and in a way that really the scriptures don't talk about as much. But what we're going to talk about this morning is the eyewitness accounts that they could claim that they had actually been privy to see with their own eyes and experience with their own lives. Let's take a look at this emphasis and how this emphasis was important to Jesus. Uh, Jesus understood the importance of his followers, his disciples, his apostles being eyewitnesses. I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. We are going to almost exclusively be in the book of Acts this morning and it's going to be very easy for you in those first 12 chapters to turn very quickly to some of the scriptures that we are going to reference. But I want us to understand what is read to us right off the bat in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 where the author Luke writing to a dignitary by the name of Theophilus says the following. He says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Here is Luke recording right off of the bat in Acts 1 that Jesus who died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, sure enough indeed did rise from the dead and that's not just some story we heard. Luke says the apostles witnessed it for a period of weeks. They were in his presence, visiting with him, talking to him, learning from him. But they witnessed this with their own eyes. Take a look also at verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus commissions the apostles not so much as teachers or preachers, but as witnesses. And here's what their task is. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Obviously, he's talking about what's going to happen just a few days from that point. Jesus would ascend into heaven. His apostles would go into Jerusalem, and they would spend some 10 days there before we arrive at Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost, where Peter and the rest of the apostles preach to the Jews who are present on that day about Jesus Christ. But he says, I want you to go, and I want you to be my witnesses to Jerusalem and to the world as, it, as the gospel message expands from there. It's important that you be there. It's important that you tell the story that only some of you can tell. But we also read about the importance of being an eyewitness to the apostles themselves. Jesus understood how important it was making sure that he was seen but he also understood, and the apostles understood, the importance of having seen these things with their own eyes and having touched these things with their own hands and being able to share this message to the world around them. Take a look, if you will, at Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Acts chapter 1. You might remember that Judas goes out and kills himself. He was one of the original twelve. And as such, they have to pick a replacement for Judas to get the number back up to 12. And so they choose ultimately a man by the name of Matthias. But these are the criteria that they use in choosing him. Verse 21 we read, Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John, until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they couldn't just pick anybody. 
They couldn't pick somebody who was simply a nice guy. They couldn't pick somebody who did well running his family or running his business. They had to pick someone who had been an eyewitness to Jesus Christ and not just some of the things, but starting with the baptism that Jesus received of John and the Jordan River, and it says all the way up to his ascension, including his death, his burial, and his resurrection, all the way up to his ascension, this kind of person has to join us in being witnesses to the world that indeed Jesus Christ, who was crucified, is both alive and is king. Well, consider something else. Let's consider the emphasis that is placed on the sermons in Acts because there is a great importance that is presented, a great foundation from which many of the apostles would derive lessons and teaching opportunities because they were eyewitnesses to the risen Savior. Take a look, if you will, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. At the climax of Peter's sermon, on the, uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter stresses that he, in fact, was an eyewitness to these things. We read, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we, talking about he and the rest of the apostles, we are all witnesses. Now, you recognize as, as well as I do that a, a person can lie. In fact, several people can lie, but the, the larger the population, the less sometimes we feel that they are at least purposefully lying. And so there is credibility. Peter says, not only I am a witness to the fact that this man has risen from the dead, but we are all witnesses to this fact. Take a look at Acts 3, verses 14 and 15. When in the sermon that takes place in the temple, Peter and John heal a crippled beggar in the temple and they attract a great crowd to listen to their preaching and again Peter preaches the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ verses 14 and 15 of Acts 3 he says but you disowned the holy <clears throat> excuse me the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you but but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact of which we are all witnesses. Peter had seen Jesus. He was a witness. Notice also what happens before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Consider also this sermon before the Sanhedrin in Acts 5, verses 29 through 32, the second encounter after having been warned not to preach in the name of Jesus or in His name. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Remember later when Peter goes to the household of Cornelius who was a Gentile? Remember Peter had to kind of be talked into going to his home to start sharing the gospel with the Gentile world. Peter doesn't lecture Cornelius on being some kind of a dirty Gentile. He actually focuses his message on, the, on Jesus Christ, on our Savior. In Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 36, and reading down through verse 41, this is what he said. He said, The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
We, verse 39, are witnesses of all the things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put to death by hanging, put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Did you notice something that was said in verse 40? It says, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. The reason that kind of resonates with me is there's a religious group who claimed that back in the earlier part of the 20th century that Jesus Christ was going to come again. They had the, the month, the day, and the year, and they said he's going to come and, and, and prepare for the day and go ahead and sell all you have because you can't take it with you and, and let's sit and wait for him to come again. Well, that particular day, that particular date came and that particular date went. And there was no second return of Christ. They came out later, and rather than being embarrassed and acknowledging that they were wrong, they came out and said, oh, well, actually, Jesus did come, but he was invisible, so you couldn't see him. Now, I have two questions for you, or let me just ask one question. If he's invisible, how do you know he came? And the point that I want to make from that is, the passage here says, God made him visible. He made him flesh again. He made him in such a way as it was undeniable to the people who witnessed his life in him again. It was an undeniable fact that the power of the Lord had brought him back to life. They were witnesses to these things. Well, let's take a look at another emphasis on witnesses in the book of Acts. Let's talk about how seeing makes all the difference. Seeing makes all the difference to a lot of people. That's certainly the case for us today as much as it was for uh, the apostles in the first century. We like to see things. We like to have hard and concrete evidence. Well, let's see how seeing Jesus in the Old Testament or in the New Testament built faith. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 3 and take a look with me in verses 1 through 3. You might remember the story of Saul. Saul was the last man on earth <laughs> that many of those first century Christians expected to convert to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, Saul was there giving approval to the death of Stephen. It was Saul who we read is wanting to destroy the church. He's a person who conscionably is good. He, he has a good conscience. He has a clean conscience because what he thinks he's doing is right and pleasing to God. He believes that this thing called Christianity is some kind of problem that is going to pervert the law of Moses. What he doesn't understand is that Jesus is a fulfillment of the law of Moses. Uh, he is the Messiah that was prophesied of old. And rather than obeying him, Saul was persecuting Christ and the church. In Acts 8, verses 1 through 3, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Jump down to chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, referencing the church, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This was somebody who sought the punishment of Christians for their Christianity. He wanted to tie them up. He wanted to bind them. He wanted to bring them to prison. He wanted them dead. Now notice what happens in Acts chapter 9 verses 3 through 6. As he, Saul, was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why 
are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. What happened to Saul? Well, quite literally, he witnessed Christ. Witnessed him in a bright and blinding light, but he came into the very presence of deity. And he changed. How do we know that? Take a look at uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. Ananias tells us what happened. Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you are coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you might remember that in Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias tells him, What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And that is indeed what Saul did. And Barnabas later in Acts chapter 9 and verse 27 had to kind of give a little defense of Saul who would become Paul the apostle and how he was in fact a witness, although in an, a different season as the Bible teaches, he was indeed a witness of the Christ. In Acts 9 and verse 27, Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. Paul himself would later in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 write the following, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel message of Jesus Christ was not something foreign to Paul. The gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was not something that was entirely foreign. We have no direct authority to say that Paul witnessed those things, but we do have direct authority that Paul witnessed Christ. And so he said, this message I received from divine authority, and it's the message that I share with you at this time. Seeing makes all the difference because seeing for the apostles also fueled their zeal and their boldness. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, we read about some who are watching the mannerisms of Peter and John. We read that they observed the confidence of Peter and John. Some of your translations say boldness and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Peter and John, who are these guys? These are just fishermen. Who, who are they? They're uneducated. They're blue-collar workers. They're, they're not the upper echelon of society. They're not the upper echelon of knowledge and intellect. They don't have multiple degrees, but we are recognizing by what they're saying and how they're behaving, they were indeed with Jesus and they must have been eyewitnesses to his life. It impacted their level of excitement about what it was they were doing and their willingness to truly put themselves out there to be courageous in spite of the many opponents that they would have had at that time. Let me take a look at one other thing here because one of the things that seeing did for the apostles, it really spurred on their evangelism. Their willingness to go out and teach and preach Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world around them. Let's take a look at some passages of Scripture here, and we're going to take a look at all of these from Acts chapter 5. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 5, you'll be able to follow along with several of these things, but I'm going to simply reference a lot of these, but the Scriptures are on the board for you to copy down if you'd like to study them in greater detail. But that faith and zeal that we just talked about truly spilled over into the evangelism 
of those who follow Jesus because they knew that Jesus had been resurrected. And they were excited about that fact. They knew that he had ascended into heaven. And they knew he was going to return. And they wanted other people to know what they knew. Chapter 5 is a marvelous example of the evangelistic fervor of the apostles. In verses 12 through 16, we see how all the believers met together at Solomon's colonnade. In other words, out in public. In verses 17 and 18, the Sadducees arrested the apostles and put them in jail. And in verses 19 and 20, we see that that very night an, a <clears throat> an angel releases them from their bonds and, tells, and sends them to the temple to tell the full message of this new life. In verses 19, in verses the first part of verse 21, we read that at daybreak they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. And in the rest of verse 21 and going down through verse 25, the full Sanhedrin convenes and sends for the apostles. Sends for them in prison, but they're no longer in prison. Where are they? They're back at the temple teaching the people. The apostles are rearrested in verses 26 through 28, and they are accused of filling Jerusalem with this teaching, the teaching that they didn't want Jerusalem to know. And in verses 29 through 32, we have that response of Peter. We must obey God rather than men. Why? Because we are witnesses, witnesses to these things. As the prophet of old said, it's like a fire burning in my bosom and I, and I just can't keep it in. I've got to let it out. Somebody said to me yesterday, said our, we were at the older kids in the youth group were with me and we were at uh, Wiki Wachi Bible Camp where we were Friday night and all day yesterday and we stayed as late as we could and arrived here at uh, 2 a.m. this morning. And yes, as I look out, all of the young people's eyes are actually open. That's good. But one of the things somebody asked me yesterday, they said, are y'all staying till this morning and leaving or are y'all leaving early? We said, no, we're leaving early. And, and they, said, uh, they said, why are you leaving early? And I said, and I wasn't really thinking, I said, well, I have to preach. And they said, do you have to preach or do you get to preach? I said, no, I have to preach. You know, I thought about that later. I was just kind of being funny at the time, but you know, I do, I have to preach. I have a message that has to be let out. I can't keep it in any more than prophets of old, any more than the apostles of the new. I have to preach. It is true I get to preach it. It's true that I get to do something that I love doing. But even if I didn't love it, even if I understood the compulsion of Paul, I would realize I still have to deliver the message. I, like the, the other apostles, I have to get the message out because people need to hear it. And if God can use me as the instrument of its deliverance, then so be it. In verses 41 and 42, despite their warnings, despite the threat of prison, what do the apostles do? They go right back to teaching. They get to teach. They have to teach because they must share the message of Jesus. How can we be witnesses today? As I mentioned to you earlier, the denominational world in particular uses the word witness in a way that's a little bit different than how the Bible uses it. Because we read about people who were eyewitnesses and people who get up today and they say, let me witness to you. Well, they were not eyewitnesses to Jesus. They did not hear with their ears His teaching or see with their eyes His marvelous works. But question, can we be witnesses today? Well, I want you to consider something in this particular section. I want us to consider the story of doubting Thomas from John chapter 4 because it teaches us that we have to realize that true discipleship for us today in particular cannot, must not depend on seeing or actual literal sight. Because if that's the case, then none of us will be able to believe. What do we learn in the story of Doubting Thomas from John chapter 4? 
beginning in verse 24. Well, you remember the story. The other apostles had seen Jesus after his resurrection. They had seen him with their eyes. They had heard him speak. They, they recognized who he was. But Thomas wasn't there when Jesus showed up to the rest of them. And in verse 24, Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, Thomas is saying, Not only must I see to believe, I have to actually feel or touch to believe after eight days his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them and Jesus came the door having been shut and stood in their midst and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side my side and do not be unbelieving but believing Thomas answered and said to him my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. You realize that although he says that regarding people of that day, he also says that about us. Because as I said in the very beginning, none of us have ever seen Jesus walk the earth. We don't know what the sound of His voice was like as far as its tone or, or uh, the sound to our ears. We've never witnessed the miracles of Jesus restoring a blind man's sight or raising Lazarus from the dead. We are not witnesses in that way. But the Bible teaches that we can be blessed. In fact, we will be abundantly happy if we can believe with faith what we have seen through the evidence revealed to us in God's Word. It's very much what Paul said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We, we New Testament Christians, members of the body of Christ, saved by being washed in the blood of the Lamb. We walk a different way than the world. Because the day the world may say, I won't believe unless I see, but we say that we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, I've never seen Jesus, but I can read the Bible, I can learn about Him, and in my mind I can not only picture Him, I can not only hear Him speaking, but I can know with certainty as much as those who are privy to be eyewitnesses of His ministry, of His life, of His death, His resurrection and His ascension. I can believe in Him with certainty that He is indeed my Lord and my God. The question for you this morning is, is He yours? If you are not a member of the body of Christ, if you have not, based upon your faith, put into action that faith by repenting of your sins, by declaring with your mouth what you believe in your heart, that Jesus is the Son of God, not to impress anybody else, but as a demonstration to God of your faith. And have you put that faith into practice by being washed in the blood of the Lamb? by being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. You see, there were many people in the first century, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, who responded to the Lord's invitation, and they did that very thing. They put on Christ in baptism. If you have not done that this morning, won't you do that right now while we have that opportunity? And if you are a child of God, are you living your life for Him? Are you increasing in your faith as you study the Word of God? And then are you taking that faith? Are you taking what you can witness in your mind's eye? And are you sharing that faith with others so that they can enjoy seeing with faith what you see today? 
If there is something that is not right in your life, take that opportunity. Take the opportunity right now to make that right. Let us help you if you can. We stand ready and willing to do anything that we can to help build you up as we ask you to help build us up so that we can together grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. If there is a way that we can help you see better and believe more, let us know how we can help you. All together, we stand and sing.